everybody. We'll get started maybe two minutes. But uh, most of you know, hopefully by now, that this winter course we're studying mindfulness of the body. So just in a very relaxed way where you don't, no one would suspect you're meditating. <laughs> just be aware of this simple, direct, subjective experience. There is a body. How do I know there's a body? Ah, oh, it, it's like this. Because this is actually what we want to do all day long, learning to live in a fully embodied way. So these little places in our lives where we're waiting, it's a really good time to realize, oh yeah, there's a body here. Can this embodied presence be sustained? Well, let's see what kind of effort is needed to sustain this embodied presence. So I went ahead and pasted uh, both the link uh, for folks who may wanna leave a contribution to the center, but also the chant that we do at the beginning of all of our Buddhist studies classes or almost all of them the three refuges, it's just our way in the early Buddhist tradition at least, but really most Buddhist traditions regularly use this chant of remembering our practice, which are these three refuges, taking refuge in Buddha, which means wakefulness, this simple, in a way, radical openness to the way it is. And Dhamma means the way that it is. So it's always Buddha, waking up to Dhamma, and that allows us, supports us in being Sangha, responding, showing up, coming this action, this way of being in the world, the choices we make coming out of Buddha knowing Dhamma, being intimate with the way it is. So let's do the chant, and then we'll sit. And to this evening in the sit, we're gonna work with the last three contemplations. So I briefly mentioned the contemplation on impermanence of body last week. So we'll do the anatomical parts, then we'll do the elements, and then we'll do the contemplation on the impermanence of the body. Now, remember these contemplations, they involve imagination and thought and keeping this contemplation in mind. So you probably can guess what I'm about to say. We do the best we can, and we let that be good enough. And when the mind gets carried away in distraction or whatever, then in a friendly way, we just begin again. And we're really exploring how to use these three contemplations that I'll guide us through as a kind of medicine that brings the mind in balance so that our relationship with the body becomes more real and less idealistic or less a matter of our habit. But we're, so these contemplations really help correct all the idealism that's in our mind around the body or all of our habits of mis, misperceiving, misunderstanding. Great. So let's go ahead and do the chant. So sitting in a comfortable upright way. I'll ring the bell three times and then we'll do the chant together. Chami 
ตุติยมพีดามังสารนังกัจฉามิตุติยมพีสังกังสารนังกัจฉามิทัตยัมพีปุตังสารนังกัจฉามิทัตยัมพีตามังสารนังกัจฉามิทัตยัมพีสังกังสารนังกัจฉามิแอนจ์จ์ดูเดอะเบสต์ยูแคนท์เมกแอนี่อัดแอสเมนท์ถ้าต้องการแอนจ์สัตว์เลี้ยงแอนด์เราเรียนรู้ความเชื่อในสิ่งที่เราเป็นอยู่ที่นี่ได้เช่นเคยและเราสามารถกลับมาถึงความรู้สึกของสิ่งที่เราเป็นอยู่ได้ดังนั้นถ้าการปฏิบัติที่ผมสอนให้เราไปทางนี้ดูเหมือนมีความเสี่ยงหรือไม่ถ้าเราไม่ได้ใช้เครื่องมือที่ถูกต้องแอนด์เราไปทางนี้ได้ดังนั้นถ้าเราไม่ได้ใช้เครื่องมือ Awareness, this kind, generous, sensitive, allowing awareness of the body. So let's take a minute or two to remember how available this whole body awareness is. Breathing in, willing to be sensitive to the whole body. Breathing out this willingness to be sensitive, open to the whole body, just as it is. One half breath at a time. And really sense the generous and kind, the generous and kind presence here. It's a beautiful way to take care of the body, to learn how to show up and sustain this present moment awareness as we breathe in, as the breath goes out. And realizing that so much in the world remains unresolved, but that's okay right now. Just to be aware, of breathing in and sensitive to the whole body, and to be aware of breathing out and sensitive to the whole body. So we're going to go through the. Anatomical parts meditation we've done the last few weeks. We began at the top of the head and just that felt sense of the head and the face in a very simple and direct way. And in particular, aware of the skin here in the head and face. And there's this very. Simple and clear understanding: there is skin, skin of the head, skin of the face. So both the felt sense of skin, however that might be for you, but also the idea, the concept. Yep, there is skin around the head and face, the ears, the eyelids, the lips. Different kinds of skin, skin around the nose, 
there is skin, just skin. And we bring the attention to both shoulders and the whole neck, front, sides and back of the neck, top of the shoulders. And again, the simple recognition, there is skin here, skin of the neck, skin of the throat, skin along the tops of the shoulders, the shoulder joints, skin. Just keeping this general body part in mind as we then let the tension come down into both arms or the biceps of both arms, skin, underarms, skin. The bend of the elbows may be slightly more callous skin, and the forearms and the wrists skin, back of the hands, palms, and skin around the fingers. Lots of skin here through both arms, hands, fingers, sensitive, understanding, skin, there's skin here. It's really a simple truth, don't feel like you're, you need to complicate things. So we begin to feel now the upper chest and sense the upper back. And again, that recognition, there is skin here. Around the rib cage, around the shoulder blades, from the shoulders down through the top part of the torso, skin. And around the diaphragm, the solar plexus, the mid spine, the mid back, skin. And the lower part of the torso, over the abdomen, over the back of the hips, around the pelvis, skin. Yes, there's skin. And from the pelvis, both thighs, skin. And over the knees, skin. And the shins and calves, skin. And around the feet, the relative callousness of the heel and bottom of the foot and the toes and top, tops of the feet recognizing the truth of skin. And as we sense the whole body and just the reality of skin throughout the body, we just contemplate it with non-attachment. Yeah, it's just skin. It's neither beautiful skin, nor is it ugly. It's just what it is. It's a bunch of skin. Some skin has hair, lots of hair, some very little hair, skin. And now from the soles of the feet will come up. And this time we're going to do our best to attune to the reality of flesh. So beginning with our toes, under the skin, there's a little fleshy parts there in the toes. And we just sense that and imagine it and recognize the reality. Yeah, there's fleshy parts there in the toes and throughout the foot. Just sensing the moist, fleshy parts there in the feet and the bigger muscles as we move up through the calves and just sensing the weight and wetness of the flesh there in the lower legs and then up through the thighs, lots of flesh, muscles, of course, other aspects of the flesh. 
And then in the lower third of the torso, all the abdominal organs, sexual organs, plush. Just contemplating in a balanced way. We're not trying to be averse. And of course, we're not probably not attracted either. It's just what it is. It's just flesh in the mid torso. the upper part of the intestines and the lower part of the lungs and all the other organs here, upper chest, so feeling, sensing the heart and the lungs and the other organs and muscles and other aspects of the flesh here in the torso. Of course, there's a lot of flesh here in the torso. Just flesh filling the body here and in the shoulders and down both arms, just sensing, recognizing the muscles, the flesh, even underneath the skin of each finger under the pads are just a little flesh, muscles, blood, the juicy parts of the body. And up through the neck, flesh. And inside the head, inside the tongue, the eyes, the brain. Lots of flesh here in the head. And throughout the whole body, taking our time for a few seconds, just acknowledging the simple truth, recognition, there is flesh. And we're cultivating this non-attachment, neither attracted nor repulsed by the flesh. Just flesh. And then coming down to the body, recognizing the truth of bones. So again, we begin at the head now and just sensing, contemplating the truth of the skull, the hardness of hardness of the jaw and the teeth, even the little bones of the inner ear, bones, bones of the head, bones of the neck, the upper spine, Bones of the collarbones and shoulders and shoulder joints here. Bones of the arms. Bones of the hands. There are these bones. So use your imagination and your felt sense. We're just keeping the simple truth in mind, bones. So we go down through the torso, sensing the structure of the rib cage, bones. Sensing the spine, bones. Sensing the thicker bones of the pelvis, hips, floor, sits bones. Lots of bone here, the pelvis and the bones coming out of the hip sockets, the thighs, bones in the knees, just bones down through the shins to the ankles, to the heels, bones and the bones of the feet and the toes. Lots of bones, little bones, bigger bones. And sensing the whole body, the bones of the whole body. Just contemplating bones, the skeleton, without any attachment, without any need to view it as beautiful or ugly. It's just bones doing what bones do. 
balance. And we're going to do the four elements. Having done the anatomical parts and really done our best to see the body in this neutral way, to tease out the story that the body is either beautiful or ugly, and to begin to have a story of the body, an idea of the body of being just these parts, a bunch of skin, a lot of flesh, and of course, all the bones. But now we'll practice viewing the body in this non-conceptual way, and we'll use the four elements. So let's begin just opening and being more specifically interested in the quality of sensation now in the head. And one of the easiest sensations to recognize is what in early Buddhism they called the earth elements. That's the hardness, softness, the smooth and roughness, heaviness and lightness. But in particular, just noticing hardness, like teeth touching teeth, hardness. So feel the earthy element of the material experience in the head. And feel the earth element in the shoulders and the neck, any heaviness, any hardness, even the relative lightness of our clothes, there's a little hardness and a little heaviness as we feel the clothes making contact with the body. There's some earthiness. And we feel the earth element in the arms and hands, especially any place of contact, the pressure, the hardness of the touch or the lightness of the touch. Opening to the entire torso with an eye, with an interest in the earth element. all the way to the floor of the pelvis. You might especially notice that in terms of the sits bones against the cushion or chair, hardness down both legs, earth, all the way down to the heels, perhaps a more clear sense of hardness down through both feet to the toes. And we take the time and we sense earth, the earth element all the way through the body from the top of the head down to the bottoms of the feet. And this earth and element that we feel, the hardness and softness and roughness and smoothness and heaviness and lightness, the specifics of our sensations, they're not really personal, are they? It's just what hardness feels like or lightness feels like. And now from the bottoms of the feet, we move up and we're going to attune to the water element, which is really more the cohesive, moist, and its opposite. It's really what they mean by that water element term. So just feeling both feet and the cohesive how the sensations, the actual sensations here now on the feet and lower legs, there's a sense of cohesiveness, like they all link together, belong together. The sensory experience of the lower legs and feet and the thighs and pelvis, this moist and cohesive 
quality we call the water element, the entire torso, how it coheres, it feels cohesive. Shoulders and arms and hands and the entire head and neck, face, whole body cohering as a unity belonging together. This is the, what in early Buddhism they called the water element. So just do the best you can to sense that and to sense that that cohesive feeling in the body now, it's not really personal. It's just this sensation being known, this particular specific aspect of sensation being known. That's all. And from the water element, we're gonna to bring to mind the fire element. So this has to do with temperature. So again, we're at the top of the head. And we're just noticing the relative heat or coolness. But everywhere we attune in the body, there is a temperature, a relative coolness or a relative warmth. Just notice the fire element throughout the head. throughout the neck and throat and shoulders, scanning and opening with the specific interest and in noticing temperature. Yeah, it's just warmth or coolness. It's just what it is, the specific aspect of sensation. Down both arms, places of relative coolness, places of relative warmth, and we're getting interested in the experience of heat and coolness. It's not really personal in the hands, of course, fingers, down the torso, front side, back side, just aware of temperature from the top to the bottom of the torso where there's heat, where there's coolness, where there's something in between. Temperature. And from the pelvis down both legs, take your time. Just a lot of temperature being known as we feel down through the body, the legs, down into the Looks like I was offline for a while. I'm not sure how long I was off. Glad you're still here. But we're about to do the last of the three reflections. We finished the anatomical parts and the four elements. And now we'll do the meditation on the impermanence of the body. So for another five or 10 minutes, sitting as comfortably as you can, without forcing it, just allowing the body to be relatively still. And we feel the breath moving in the body. <clears throat> and this movement of breath in a way is our gauge, right? As long as the breath is moving, we know there is life in this body. And there's something really profound in making that obvious and simple connection between the movement of the breath and the life of this body. That they're really, of course, completely tied. No life without breath, no breath without life. So just contemplate that for a few breaths the breath of life. Keep 
Each breath, as we know, just in this biological sense, feeding, helping to feed all the systems, the cells, the organs with oxygen. And the other thing we can contemplate, so the first thing is just the relationship between the breathing process <clears throat> and the life of the body. And the second thing to contemplate is <clears throat> we know the breath will end at some point with the death of the body, but we don't know when that's going to happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. We know the body will die. We know the breath will end, but we don't know when. So the contemplation now for the next five minutes is as you're breathing in in a relaxed way, in your own way, in a way that feels appropriate, just contemplate the uncertainty of when the last breath will be. Even, although not likely, this could even be the last in-breath. I don't really know. And then as you exhale, just practice relaxing, coming into the body, feeling like you belong in the moment. And then again, pick up with the next in-breath. Oh yeah, this could be the last breath in, who knows? And even if it isn't the last breath in, for sure it's one breath closer to the last breath. Now everybody has to kind of find their own way with this contemplation. So again, with the in-breath, we're just contemplating the uncertainty of the time of death. In fact, it could even be this breath as the last. We don't really know. And with the out-breath, we just soothe and invite a relaxation and we pick up the reflection again. Is this the last breath? Well, I know it's one breath closer at the very least to the last breath. So just do the best you can for the next five minutes. And you can even simplify the reflection with the in-breath. You can contemplate the simple truth, this body will die. And with the out-breath, right now this body is alive and it's okay to relax. Something like that. But find your own way, experiment a little. See what seems helpful.
So we're simply normalizing the truth of uncertainty, the truth of mor mortality. We're not trying to make a big deal about it. We're just grounding in what has always been true. This isn't a new truth. If we're surprised, it's just because we've been in denial or distracted. This body will die. Can this be okay? Can it actually be peaceful and enlivening to integrate or to open to the reality of uncertainty, the reality that this body will die? And that this present moment, this is what we have, this moment, one moment at a time, this is what we have. And finally, just to contemplate for a few more seconds, again, using imagination, using thought, what would it be like for me to live attuned to the truth of the mortality of this body, like to be integrating, remembering in a very ordinary but ongoing way, never to be forgetful that this body will die and I don't know when or how. And of course, as you open your eyes now and look at the screen and sense that you live with other people perhaps or neighbors not only will this body end but everybody's body dies all my loved ones my neighbors and not only that nobody really knows when or how this really omnipresent truth of uncertainty it's always been like this. Things have always been uncertain around the how and the when of the ending of this body. So just imagine, well, what would it be like? You know, we're just kind of contemplating, imagine tomorrow, later this evening, what, it would, what would it feel like? What would it be like to always have that integrated in. Not that I'm thinking about it obsessively, but just like, oh yeah. Just like we're learning to be embodied, to be aware of sensation. Or even including in that experience of embodiment, it's fragility, like it's, it's here now. It feels like this now. There's an in-breath and uh, an out-breath now, but I'm not sure about later. The future is uncertain. The past is gone. All I really have is this moment. That's all I have is this moment. And so we move through life as with the sense that there's nothing out there in the so-called future that's dependable. It's, it's by very definition not dependable. It's uncertain. That's just the very nature of the what we call the future. It's unknown. We have this, but we don't know what's next. We just don't know this. So I really encourage you to play with this contemplation for this last week of our course and then for the rest of our lives. <laughs> it's really powerful contemplation. And like a lot of the Buddhist contemplations, there's really an important place for um, creativity. Like, how am I going to keep it in mind? And how will I know I've gotten off track and I'm just being morbid? Or I'm doing it in a light way, L-I-T-E, you know, not, not really kind of putting my heart in a place where there's learning and discovery. How can I find that sweet middle ground where there's some playfulness, it's enlivening, but there's some real learning too. I'm, I'm realizing things, seeing things that I haven't 
discovered or realized or understood before through the contemplation of impermanence. And we'll talk more about it tonight, but feel free to take a moment and stretch. And very sorry, I don't know why my internet cut out, but it seems, thanks for the note, whoever wrote it, that I was gone for about 10 minutes. I was having a nice meditation, I hope you were. <laughs> and just so you know, I record these and they go up on Dharma Seed. So um, we'll send you out the audio, which is complete because I'm recording it separate than the Zoom room. And uh, I'll have Gabe take a look at the Zoom recording. I'm assuming that, um, that it, it will have that same gap that you experienced. But I just finished, you know, the four elements meditation. So after temperature, you know, there's the wind element that we go up through the body with, you know, just feeling pressure and pushing and movement. That's what you missed. Good, so um, what I did tonight in the guided meditation you can do because you have access to Venerable Analio doing that guided meditation. And there's a lot of words, right? Cause we're, we're using our imagination, but you wanna internalize it so you can do it at your own pace and uh, in your own creative ways. And we have these three contemplations that are used to correct how we relate to the body, right? The anatomical parts and the elements, and now tonight the impermanence, and we'll emphasize the reflection of impermanence next week as well. And I think I mentioned earlier in the course that um, the whole path, really, you can understand the whole spiritual path. We're using our life and we're using awareness and we're using contemplation to transform the way the mind or the heart understands. So there's only one problem with life. Thanks, Barbara. Let me zip this up. Yeah, there's only one problem with life, according to the way the Buddha analyzes the problem. And that problem is that we're misunderstanding. And then we're living as if our way of understanding is real or correct. And so our way of acting in the world, the way of thinking is off because it's based on an understanding that isn't in, in alignment with the way it actually is. So the medicine the Buddha gives us is cultivate the stability of wisdom and awareness, learn how to be intimate, Buddha waking up to Dhamma, be intimate with the way that it is. And that willingness, it's not easy, but that willingness to be awake, to have that balanced, clear, kind, present moment awareness in an ongoing way, that's what transforms our understanding. We don't think our way towards wise view or think our way towards insight. People have tried that since the beginning of time, or at least since the time of the Buddha, and all you do is get a headache, or even worse, maybe you become, this is a joke, a professor of philosophy or something like that, right? One of the funniest talks I ever heard from Ajahn Sumedho, a really important teacher of mine, was him joking about there's nothing more, I'm not sure what word he used, but something like pathetic or undesirable as having to go to an international conference of Buddhism <laughs> and talk philosophically about the ideas of Buddhism, because it's kind of missing the point. The ideas, the teachings are really jumping off points for this. And remember like with the anatomical parts, it's the first thing where we, we use that contemplation of anatomical parts to basically come up with a more accurate story. We're still on the level of concept because when I'm contemplating skin or flesh or bones, or if you do the more traditional 32 parts, you know, and the different organs and the different, you know, hair of the head, hair of the body, nails of the hands, nails of the toes, right? So you've got all the different parts. Those are concepts too. But we're this uh, using the 32 body parts or the more simple form of flesh or skin, flesh and bones, right? It, it's a more powerful story, a more accurate story then the next contemplation of the elements, we're really going from the good story, oh yeah, this body is just a bunch of parts, to 
what is it actually subjectively? What is sensation? It's not even a body in terms of, or skin, flesh and bones. It's really hardness, softness, smoothness, roughness, lightness, heaviness, warmth, coolness, movement, stillness, that cohesive sense of the body as a whole. And what am I missing? Did I get them all? Right, so it, it's just the specifics of the elements. So one of the things that, uh, you know, we like three levels of reality, you could say we have the conceptual level and then we have the specific characteristics level. Like in terms of our visual experience, we have the, you know, the color and the shape in terms of the auditory experience, you know, timber, pitch, whatever, the different elements, the words we use that point to the elements of the auditory experience. And then in sensation, we have these four elements that I've been talking about tonight, right? So for each of our sensory experience, there are these specific characteristics of that that aren't dependent on concept. I mean, we have a concept like heaviness and lightness, but the experience of heaviness doesn't need the word heaviness. The experience of lightness or roughness or smoothness isn't dependent on the concept. Just like seeing a bright light isn't dependent, that subjective experience of seeing a bright light isn't dependent on the vocabulary bright light. So the second contemplation of the elements is really helping us go from even a good story about the body to the more actual elemental level. So from that first, where we're just sort of correcting the idea of the body as this whole thing, me, <laughs> you know, all wrapped up nicely in this bag of skin. And then on top of that, we have our clothes and our other decorations. And that's what we take for the body. And then we realize, no, you know what? It's just a bunch of parts. It's just a bunch of parts that are neither attractive nor non-attractive. It's just stuff, lots of stuff, you know? And then we go from that concept to actually subjectively, it's just these specific sensations, this dance of sensation. And these sensations that I'm experiencing all the time it's really not different than the, you know, the collection of sensations you're experiencing or any being. You know, my experience of hardness isn't probably that different than my cat's experience of hardness. Not my idea. My idea of hardness is very different than probably my cat. Like what I add to that experience of hardness or warmth. But the direct experiencing of warmth is very impersonal. It's not specific to this being or that being, right? So that's what, and that second, that shift from the conceptual to the actual, that's Dhamma. When we talk about Dhamma, one of the definitions of that word Dharma or Dhamma is the way it is, like not mediated so much by the concept. I mean, we do have concepts that like heaviness or hardness, but we can know hardness without sort of the um, being contaminated by the concept or the label. And then there's a step more, and this is really what this last contemplation really helps us with, the contemplation now traditionally, and we'll talk, we'll get to it tonight and for sure next week if we don't have time tonight, but they, they, um, the Buddha recommends actually, you know, we don't see it too much these days, um, body's actually fall apart. <laughs> you know, we're very good at either filling a dead body with preservatives or burning it. So we don't really see that with a human body. And we don't really, in the city at least, we don't really see it too much even with other bodies. Sometimes, you know, if we're lucky, we see a fly that has been at the window. And then all of a sudden we see the corpse of the fly sitting there on the window seal, you know, and then after a few weeks, it becomes devoid of any moisture. So it's just like light as nothing. But, you know, that's sort of the rare event where we see some kind of decomposition, the very natural falling apart of a body. So traditionally you would do a, what's called a cemetery or corpse contemplation. And you would just imagine it. And there, you know, because there's 
a lot of Buddhists out there in the wider world, online, you can find very clear pictures of uh, the comp uh, decomposition of a body. People have contributed their bodies, you know, before they die, of course, they agree to sort of let their bodies fall apart and somebody takes photographs so that people who want to do this contemplation, but we have our imaginations. But Venerable Analio, you know, he created this uh, very simple way of just connecting impermanence with the breath. But I put three meditations in the email this afternoon, one by one of the senior bhikkhunis, Buddhist nuns, uh, Aya Mendanandi, a really wonderful, powerful teacher, one by Venerable, two by Venerable Analio. One was the one we did tonight with the breath and just contemplating, oh yeah, this could be the last breath, but certainly it's one breath closer. Okay, can I be okay? Can I relax? Can I settle? Okay, let me bring that up again as I'm breathing. Oh yeah, one more breath in, maybe the last, who knows? And then relax with the out breath. So that's one. And the other one is more of a traditional reflection that Venerable Analio offers. So for those of you who want more of that traditional medicine, Dharma medicine of the corpse contemplation, remember it's a medicine to be used appropriately. It's not about scaring ourselves and it's not about going down some obsessive tunnel. Oh my God, I'm going to die. Where we just, because we can really scare ourselves, but it's not death that we're afraid of. It's our idea of death that's scary. And that's really important. That's this thing about using the idea of death to help bring us into the vivid simplicity of the present moment. And to do that, we have to remove the idea of the past and the future. The future is uncertain. Isn't that true? Anybody have any guarantees about the future? We don't. Anything could happen. Things do happen. I mean, I don't know if you caught this in the paper, but a very big piece of a jet's engine fell from the sky outside of Denver just a couple of days ago. And there's just a picture. I mean, this thing, it looked, it was, you know, piece of the engine, the round piece. It was a big piece of metal just fell from the sky. I don't think it hurt anybody. Um, but I mean, this kind of stuff can happen. And no, it's again, not about frightening ourselves, but just like, I can't count on tomorrow, I certainly can't count on 20 more years. And when I'm really <clears throat> honest, when I think about the future more and more, I have this reality, who knows? Oh yeah, that's possible, but who knows? Oh, that would be nice, but who, who knows? Oh, I don't want that to happen, but who knows? Who knows? And then we remember the past is gone, the future is uncertain. There's only this moment, one moment at a time. And <clears throat> that's really the point of the contemplation of death because that really brings us from the specific characteristics of the body that we do with the elements contemplation to this universal truth that nothing can be counted on. And that's true with our body. <clears throat> and when we haven't done the contemplation of impermanence, strangely, even though intellectually we know the body's going to die, I'm sure this is not a surprise to anybody in the group, right? Like, I don't see anybody freaking, what? <laughs> this body's going to die? Nobody told me. <clears throat> so we know intellectually, but can we take that intellectual knowing and, and really like let it get integrated in throughout the moment to moment understanding the way the mind is sort of constructing meaning. Can it integrate into the moment to moment meaning? Oh yeah, this is what is. The future is unknown and uncertain. The past is completely gone, doesn't exist. And any idea I have about the past is that 
ephemeral thing right here and now. Oh yeah, Sunday I did this, but that's here and now, and then it's gone. And the past doesn't exist, and the future is uncertain, and I have this, and this, and this. This is what we have. So this is from uh, Christina Feldman's book, Boundless Heart. She's one of our senior teachers in this Western Vipassana, insight meditation, or more and more we call it early Buddhism. Mostly teaches at uh, Gaia House in England. And she's writing about these four distortions because I've been mentioning that these three contemplations and then in the spring, which by now uh, you can register now for the Buddhist studies course in the spring, where we'll be contemplating feeling tone, the pleasantness and unpleasantness of experience. Um, these parts of the Satipatthana, the Buddhist teachings on mindfulness, they're really about correcting our view, how we relate to experience. And when we contemplate the anatomical parts, we're correcting this habit of seeing things in terms of being beautiful or ugly, you know? And it's like, it's totally okay to know what you find beautiful and what you find disgusting. There's no problem with that. But we want to understand that when I see something beautiful, it's because of how I'm looking at the experience. Like, for example, we have some paintings and pictures in our living room where I'm at. And, you know, if I look at the picture as a whole, I might go, I like that picture. But if I look at one little piece, you know, some pigment or some brush strokes or some part of the wood frame, I don't find that attractive. What I find attractive is the whole thing, right? It's the same thing if we see a person we find attractive. Is it the skin on the backside of their index finger that we find attractive? No, it's the whole package right, that we find attractive. Same thing with disgusting. You know, if we see something we don't like, is it because of, you know, this little thing or that little aspect of it? No, it's the sort of general conclusion, I don't like that. So when we learn this power of deconstructing experiences into the parts, it really takes away this duality of beauty and ugliness attractiveness and unattractiveness. We realize more and more as we live our life, that's just a construction. It can be a useful construction. We're not saying it's an evil construction of our mind. We're just understanding that it's a duality the mind constructs. So do this, you know, when you're around like a body that you find attractive, just, just play with it like you're wherever. I mean, we're not hanging out very much together, but you know, on TV, you see a body you find attractive, then just deconstruct it. Oh yeah, that body has a bunch of skin, has a bunch of fleshy parts, their bones. Yeah. Probably a liver in there somewhere, you know, probably nails, toenails, fingernails, hair of the head, hair of the body, probably some fat in that body, some muscle. You know, you just kind of Remember that. And you'll see that how your mind understands, like the seductiveness of the idea that it's pleasant gets weaker or that it's attractive. It just gets weaker. You can do the same thing with something you find disgusting. And you realize, you know, you know, next time you see a spider that you find disgusting, well, you know what it is? It's just some fluid in there. Not much, but some juicy parts in a spider, right? And some, they have an exoskeleton, I suppose. So not so much bones, but like the hard exoskeleton. And, you know, so no skin, I guess. <laughs> a little hair, right? They, get, they have some hair, I guess, maybe that skin. But it's just those parts. And when you really like, if, if you just came across a little part of a spider, you wouldn't think, oh, repulsive, right? Or anything that you think is repulsive. It's just, oh, it's just that little piece of that. So play with this contemplation, how it corrects that distortion of there are, the things are either beautiful or ugly. So um, this is from Christina. She's talking about these four distortions, 
the absence of beauty is just one of them. Like we move through life as if things are beautiful and ugly. She writes, the chaos, confusion, and struggle so familiar to us is not a life sentence, but created and recreated through confusion one moment at a time. Understanding for ourselves the anatomy of confusion, we can dispel it one moment at a time. Learning to liberate the single moment from struggle is a building block of coming to know the end of all the confusion and the liberated heart. Now I put this in the I put this little blurb in uh, the we, uh, the email this afternoon, so I want to read one more paragraph where she goes through these four distortions, distortions of how we perceive and think and view. So she she writes. The Buddha identified four primary tools of confusion and struggle. The first is the tendency to seek and see permanence in a life that is purely process, fluid, dynamic, and changeable. The second is to see the beautiful and that which is not implicitly beautiful. That's what we just talked about. We posit the capacity to deliver happiness in that which cannot yield enduring happiness and find ourselves enchanted not only with the world of objects, but with our own fantasies about the happiness those objects, events, and experience will deliver. The third is to see that which is unsatisfactory as being satisfactory. Stripped of confidence and aspiration, we resign ourselves to a world of confusion and despair marked by transient moments of pleasure. The fourth is to see an independent self in all things, the tendency to rarefy and define ourselves by changing phenomena and to invest in independent self-existence in all things occurs in each moment of clinging. The Buddha suggested that as long as these distorted views, perceptions, ways of thinking remain unquestioned, there are in place all the necessary ingredients for the creation and recreation of suffering. Distress, she writes. These views deeply embedded in our consciousness are the fertile ground for craving, aversion, fear, and grasping to grow. They are the fuel of perpetuating all distress. In any moment of distress and struggle in our lives, we can learn to pause and examine the anatomy of that distress. We can learn to liberate our hearts, to relinquish our arguments with the unarguable. And that, that's a great line. To, relinqu to relinquish our arguments with the unarguable and to come to know what, is, what it is to live in the light of what we know an embodied understanding. So that, again, that's from Christina Feldman's book, Boundless Heart. It's a really nice book. It's on the four divine abodes of loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. From one of my teachers, uh, Saida Utejaniya, we can't really know the body. We can only think of the body, but we cannot experience body, he has in quotes. We experience the feeling of the elements, earth, water, heat, and air, right? So this is what we're learning. We're um, taking up the these three contemplations of the body, and then we're noticing how the way we understand, perceive, and think about the body slowly changes. Now, this isn't going to be overnight. I mean, you might have a so-called breakthrough experience or insight but generally it's a slow, gradual process of transforming the way the mind perceives, thinks about, and understands. And it's not just this body, but other people's bodies too. We're transforming how we perceive and think and understand body. So this is so interesting that the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha's talk on the, how to establish mindfulness, is really mostly about correcting our view because we have so much programming in terms of how we see body that we can't actually be mindful of the body. 
like when we sit down to meditate, especially as a new meditator, it's like, you know, we might have a moment where we realize, oh yeah, the body's sitting, it feels like this, like a real moment of the elements, like feeling the hardness of the butt on the cushion or something like that. But immediately we're in our idea and it's some mental image of the body. And then we're in our idea that I don't like my body or I got a great body, you know, or how about my body compared to that body? And then we're pretty soon we're just off to the races and one thought leading to the next because we don't know how to be in the immediacy of the experience of the body. It takes some real practice. We're very much used to being living basically in our ideas about things. So I wanna save some time to go um, to the questions that people have sent in. But before this, and we'll spend more time next week, let me just read the <clears throat> traditional cemetery contemplation. And remember, we're using this as a useful, helpful medicine. So remember like when we were kids and we didn't like hearing what we were hearing, we go, la, 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 la. <laughs> but you have something more sophisticated. You can just mute me or turn the volume down. But remember, even though it's, you know, this traditional way of seeing the decomposition of a body, you know, it's not really ugly. The fact that things mold, you know, or fester or bloat or whatever, that's just nature. All of this life that we're participating in only exists because things fall apart. If things didn't fall apart, we wouldn't have life, right? Life depends on this recycling of everything and recycling depends on things breaking down. So the fact that we find it disgusting generally, right, is simply because we haven't done the work to integrate the truth of impermanence. And when we do that and we stumble upon a body that's been dead, like a dead squirrel that's been dead for, you know, a couple months, we won't have that wave of repulsion when we see the maggots or we see this or we see that about it. It will be more, whoa, that's kind of interesting. You know, oh, this is how that happens. This is what that smells like or looks like. Oh, oh yeah, of course, of course. So here, here we go. This is the translation and this is Venerable Analio's translation of the, this section uh, where the Buddha is talking about mindfulness of body. And this is the third contemplation as though, right, because we're using our imagination, as though one were to see a corpse thrown away in a charnel ground that is one, two, three days dead, being bloated, livid, and oozing matter. And one compares the same body with it. This body, too, is of that same nature. It will be like that. It is not exempt from that fate. So then we just sit with that truth. And again, you can just use your imagination. You probably, to some degree, you know, even if it's just meat that was left in the fridge too long and we sense that breakdown. Oh yeah, this body has the same nature as that. I'm not exempt from that nature. This body rather is an exempt from that. And then the second, again, as though one were to see a corpse thrown away in a charnel ground that is being devoured by crows and hawks and vultures, dogs and jackals, or various kinds of worms. So this is the second part of that contemplation. Oh yeah, how natural it would be for animals, other animals, other creatures to feed on a body that's died? Well, of course. Have you ever noticed that when a bird hits one of our windows, you know, and dies, it isn't long before it's gone. Whether it's the raccoon that gets it or a cat, but something's gonna eat it. So we contemplate that, keep it in mind. Notice what effects it has in the heart. The third, a corpse thrown away in a charnel ground, 
a skeleton with flesh and blood held together by the sinews. A skeleton without flesh, smeared with blood and held together by the sinews. A skeleton without flesh and without blood, held together by the sinews, right? So it's just the skeleton is drying out. Disconnected bones scattered in the main. Here a hand bone, elsewhere a foot bone, elsewhere a shin bone, elsewhere a thigh bone, elsewhere a hip bone, elsewhere a backbone, elsewhere a skull, right? So the sinews have disintegrated and probably other creatures have scattered the bones. So you could just imagine now the bones aren't even held together as a whole skeleton. Oh yeah, just bones. A corpse thrown away in a charnel ground, bones bleached white, the color of shells. We probably have stumbled upon, I know at Prairie Farm, Common Grounds Retreat property, out in the woods, they are, uh, they must have slaughtered some cows out there because they're big bones just sort of scattered here and there in the woods. And uh, it's where they recently, I mean, this is probably more than 40 years ago because they planted some trees. So this was probably at one time a field where they maybe slaughtered some cows. They, they look too big to be deer bones. Bones heaped up more than a year old bones rotten and crumbling to dust. And one compares the same body with it. This body too is of the same nature. It will be like that. It is not exempt from that fate. Good, so that's the traditional cemetery reflection. And we'll come back to that next week in a suitable way, but I wanna, cover some of the wonderful comments and questions that people have sent in. Let's see if we can get to some of them. So I mentioned Mary sent this in last week and there's really three questions that are about dispassion towards the body. So this is from Mary. I'm just reading part of the email that came in. Of late, I've been exploring the benefits of being more in touch with my body and its messages as opposed to controlling it in an effort to conform to my wishes, and then in parentheses, to be thinner, stronger, etc. In the class meditations and the meditations you've suggested we explore, it seems to suggest being detached from the body. Would you please comment on the difference between being attuned to the body versus understanding the body as skin, flesh, and bones? Well, that first contemplation, the anatomical parts, is really just to challenge the story, the concept we have of the body by presenting another very compelling story because rationally we know it's just a bunch of parts. So that's why it's a compelling story. And it challenges the story of the body as a whole, which is very tied to all my thoughts about my body. When I think about my body, I'm not thinking about the parts. I'm thinking about the whole thing, right? So we're challenging that with that and, uh, you know, interestingly, the freedom from attachment, being attached to our concepts and ideas, our inaccurate concepts and ideas, it depends on being more intimate, more truthful, having a more honest, real relationship with the body. So we think of detachment like, oh yeah, skin, flesh and bones, I'm getting detached but actually we want the movement to be the opposite. We wanna learn how to come home. We wanna learn how to live in this embodied way, but to do it, we have to uproot these idealistic ideas we have about the body. And that's really what these three contemplations are about. So um, people are absolutely right. The way we relate to the body is gonna radically change. It will get cooler more balanced, but it won't be less intimate. It will be more and more intimate and more and more real and more and more sensitive. 
how we relate to this body, how we relate to other bodies. But what we will have to grieve our idea of the body, because our idea of the body, our conception of the body has never been real. It's an idea, a story. And a, and a story that's not that connected with reality. And that, that's, it's challenging and it's a powerful shift. This shift of how we ordinarily relate to body to what the Buddhist teachings lead us, the way it leads us to relate to the body. But you'll see that everything works better when we have a more grounded, accurate, intimate relationship with the body. So that detachment, if you're feeling detached, separate, then you might wanna to talk to a teacher or reflect on what you're doing and how aversion might be creeping into your reflection. These reflections are not about aversion. We're not forcing anything. We're just trying to get closer to the way it is. Buddha knowing Dhamma. Thanks for that, Mary. And like I said, uh, the next two, one from Charlie and one from Scott, kind of hitting different angles of the same thing. Um, this is from Charlie. I understand that seeing the body as a pile of different stuff, similar to a bag of seeds, can help us relate with a cool, liberating, and peaceful dispassion. In rare moments, I have touched this and seen its value. However, I wonder how to integrate this insight with sexual energy. It feels wholesome and right not to deny or run away from sexual energy and have it, to be, and have it be a part of a healthy partner relationship. But so often sexual energy is intimately related to perceptions of the body as inherently attractive, which maybe seems at, odd, at odds with viewing it as a pile of stuff. So it feels like perhaps two wholesome aspirations are in conflict. Yeah, a very interesting thing for us, all of us who are involved in sexual activities to explore, not force anything, but to explore because we're interested and just having a more honest, grounded, intimate relationship with reality. And, and like, are we willing to allow our way of uh, you know, engaging sexual energy, are we willing to let it change as we change? Well, for one, it's already changing. You know, I'm 62. How I relate to sexual energy is different than when I was 30, right? So things are changing anyway around that. And the question is, are we afraid of the truth or not? Do we want to align with the truth or do we want to align with all the pop songs we heard about bodies, <laughs> you know, and love and sex. What do we trust more? And it's a really interesting thing to explore. I'm not saying that it uh, isn't impactful. I'm just saying maybe that's okay that it's impactful. And maybe like uh, Charlie says in this last uh, paragraph that I didn't read, you know, um, Let's see, I suppose one possible resolution to the seeming tension is that there are other channels through which sexual energy can be expressed. Now that would be a very interesting thing for us to explore. And Charlie writes, aside from perceptions of the body as essentially beautiful, such as a basic sense of trust, respect, and appreciation with another person, or just the simple, pleasant physical sensations of sexual energy. Yeah, something more, less obsessive and more about play and more about generosity, helping each other feel good, right? Because we care and because it's not causing anybody harm. So why wouldn't we want to play together in a way that we both find pleasant? And what is pleasantness? Well, that's the spring course, <laughs> right? Mindfulness of feeling tone. That's what we'll be doing in the uh, seven week spring course, we'll be digging into that. Let's say we have time maybe for Scott's comment. In follow up to last week's class on mindfulness of the body, I see the importance of not identifying with or being attached to the body 
and how seeing it as impermanent, even decaying, a pile of ashes can be helpful. But as a chiropractor who was previously an architecture student, I've always seen the human brain as the most incredible computer and the human body with its many complex systems all whirling away in harmony as a symphony of function and form. And I have felt that we are all so lucky to have been gifted with these as the vehicles we get to explore life with. This makes it tricky to consider the brain or body as just skin, flesh, and bones. I see that even, I see that even fantastic machines are impermanent and the risk of attachment, poor attachment that seeing the body as incredible creates, but it really is <laughs> your thoughts. Thanks Scott for that great question. Yeah, and it's all about medicine. Like this is the thing that the Buddhist teachings are really valuable, which is perception, thought, and understanding is to be used pragmatically. See, our, in our ordinary way, we think that perception and how we think and how we understand, it's all about truth in an absolute sense. But it, from the Dharma point of view, we're using perception, thinking, and the way we view to correct bad habits. It's not that one view is <clears throat> correct and another is wrong. It's we want to be free of all fixed views. So to be free of the fixedness, the mind being dependent on an idea, we use ideas that challenge the fixed ideas um, skillfully. We use ideas to challenge fixed ideas, thereby liberating the mind from fixed ideas. Then do we hold on to the idea we use to liberate the mind from a fixed idea? No, we let it go. And that's that, a lot of you have heard that, and I'll end here, that famous talk where the Buddha talks about the raft, right? We use the raft to cross the flood all of our habits of worrying and fretting and lamenting and struggling. And then the Buddha asks, so once you got across the flood, what do you do with the raft? You let it go. You don't carry the raft around. So we're using these contemplations, not as absolute truths. So it's like, for example, if, if somebody um, was raised and conditioned to think of the body as being disgusting and my body is no good, then they might really want to meet with Scott and to sort of borrow his perception of the body where he has this capacity to see the beauty in nature because the body is just nature, right? And that might really help that person heal and challenge the fixed view that my body's ugly or no good, right? Unattractive. But if somebody has this sort of you know, they're enthralled with their body or just bodies in general, then they might want to see it in a more ordinary, unattractive way. Oh, it's just a bunch of parts, right? Because that contemplation, all three of these contemplations, anatomical parts, the elements, impermanence, they're just skillful means to help loosen our fixed ideas of the body. They're not about the truth. It's about the truth in a sense, you know, the liberating truth is realizing the mind that isn't fixed. That can be in a world of ideas, can use language, but doesn't neurotically hold to ideas, including the idea of self. But we're out of time, so I need to leave it here. Sorry again about the interruption. Let's see, there were a few announcements I wanted to make. We are. Uh, Shelly's doing a day long retreat on Saturday. A lot of you, or some of you, might know Ellen Hupschmidt, a longtime leader in the center. Uh, Ellen was a hospice chaplain up in uh, the Duluth area for a number of years. And one of the North Shore radio stations did a series of interv interviews about end of life. Uh, and Ellen's one of the people that uh, was interviewed. And we have those uh, interviews that those radio programs on our blog, which is, you could find the blog right on our homepage uh, website. And you might wanna to listen to some, and especially relevant given what we're talking about these last two weeks of our course. 
And then, like I mentioned, you can go ahead and register if you've got time on Monday night in the spring. We'll be beginning the uh, mindfulness of feeling tone. I think it begins the week after we end this class, um, the first Monday in, uh, no, I guess, I guess it will be two weeks from tonight, it will begin. So join in for that course if you'd like and go ahead and register. And last thing is I'll be doing a half day retreat on the 6th if you wanna join in in the afternoon. So have a good week, everybody. Thanks so much for being here.